Well, welcome back, everyone, to our study gleanings from the Minor Prophets. Um, last week, we began looking at together, studying together the book of Amos. Um, so far, um, I've asked you to read the entire book of Amos at one sitting. I told you not to cheat, so I hope that you follow through with that. But it's very important that we understand uh, the book of Amos as a whole and not necessarily as individual, individual chapters, even though we are looking at it chapter by chapter, we still need to think about it as a whole. So far in our study together, we have established a trust date, a date that we can trust of when Amos was written in the 8th century, around 750 B.C. Now we know this because of the internal uh, biblical hints supported uh, by extra biblical research, so we have inter, we have hints in the Bible as to when it was written, and then we look at extra biblical research and we try to establish uh, any any correlation between the two because historical context is is very important to understanding the biblical context. We also established the two basic themes of Amos, which we see in most of the minor prophetic books and some of the major prophetic books: uh, God's pending judgment and then God's promised blessing, a common theme in the Old Testament. Well, today we begin working our way through uh, chapters 1 and 2. I am going to cover uh, both chapters 1 and 2. So today our lesson together, our Bible study, may be a little bit longer than usual, but I really want to get through the first two chapters, and then um, after that we can kind of take it a little bit slower. But for today... I need to do two chapters. So we're going to um, look through chapters 1 and 2, and very basically, um, Amos can be thought of uh, through three very basic sections. I've shared that with you already. Section 1, Amos chapters 1 and 2. I've listed and given the title of that section, God's message to the nations and Israel. Section 2, Amos chapters 3 through 6, God's message to Israel and her leaders, um, his leaders. And then section 3, Amos chapter 7 through 9, the visions of Amos. So that's a very basic section division of the book of Amos. Now, literally, no, that's the wrong word. Literarily speaking, the book of Amos has been commonly classified in three ways. Now, this is common classifications, basic classifications. First, chapters 1 and 2, they've been classified as poetry. Second, chapters 3 through 6, they have been classified generally as sermons. And then the third section, uh, commonly classified, chapter 7 through 9, visions. So we have three sections, poetry, chapters 1 and 2, sermons, chapters 3 through 6, and visions, chapters 7 through 9. So as we begin today, we begin with poetry. Now, knowing that chapter 1 and 2 are basically poetry, what can we expect? Well, we can expect heavy metaphorical language, heavy use of metaphor. Uh, some things were literal, some things were metaphorical. Uh, we also can see examples of parallelism. Uh, parallelism is simply the use of successive verbal constructions, verbal cues, which correspond in either grammatical structure, sound, meter, or meaning. That's what parallelism means. So in chapters 1 and 2, really throughout Amos, we see uh, metaphor. Some things are literal, some things are metaphorical. It's up to us to, do, to figure out and decide which ones are literal and which ones are metaphorical. Well, chapter 1, let's go ahead and get started, and we are going to read all of chapters 1 and 2 today together. I first want to start <clears throat> with um, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. So if you have your Bibles, I you know, want you to join me, read with me here, um, so we can be on literally the almost the same page, depends on what translation you're using. 1, 1 through 5. The words of Amos, one of the shepherds of Tekoa, 
The vision he saw concerning Israel two years before the earthquake, when Uzziah was king of Judah and Jeroboam son of Joash was king of Israel. He said, The Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds dry up and the top of Carmel withers. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire on the house of Hazel that will consume the fortresses of Ben-Hadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to Kerr, says the Lord. In verses 1 and 2, we are introduced to the main characters of the entire book of Amos. First, who are we introduced to? First, we were introduced to Amos, a shepherd of Tekoa. Well, in our reading, remember I asked you to read the entire book of Amos. Well, in our reading, is this all that we can know about Amos, chapter 1? Verses 1 and 2, is that all that we can know about him? No. Look at chapter 7, verses 14 and 15. So look at chapter 7 of Amos, verses 14 and 15. Amos answered Amaziah, I was neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I was a shepherd, and I also took care of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord took me from tending the flock and said to me, Go prophesy to my people Israel. And then he get, goes into what the Lord told him to say. Well, chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 7, verse 14 and 15, we get a bigger picture, we get almost a complete picture of Amos. Amos was not a prophet in the expected sense by birth. Amos was not the son of a prophet. He was a shepherd. He was a caretaker of sycamore fig trees. But the Lord, in his wisdom, in his sovereignty, took Amos from tending the flock and said to him, Go, be a prophet. Go prophesy to my people Israel. Amos wasn't born a prophet. But later in his life, God called him to go and be a prophet. God's will, God's way. We don't understand it. We don't have to understand it all. God's will, God's way. He's God, we're not. Well, Topeka was part of the southern tribes of Israel. Bethel, where he went to prophesy in the heart of Israel, was the northern tribes of Israel. Now, I thought it was interesting that God chose someone from the southern tribes of Israel, Judah, to go and prophesy against the northern tribe of Israel, Israel, in Bethel. I thought that was interesting that God would choose one group, the southern tribes, two, and go and prophesy against the ten northern tribes, Israel. Now, as we do our extra-biblical research on the name of Amos, his name in original Hebrew means to carry. A burden carrier. Well, Amos' burden was to carry the words that God gave him through the prophet, through the prophecy. He called him to be a prophet to the people of Israel. Amos was living in Topeka. Chapter 1, verse 1, God sent Amos to Bethel, the very heart. We saw that in 7, 14, and 15, the very heart of Israel. And we understand that from chapter 7, verse 10. Chapter 7, verse 10. I think I said 14 and 15. Chapter 7, verse 10, we saw that. Bethel, the very heart of Israel. In verse 1, the second main character that we are introduced to is whom? Jeroboam. It's Jeroboam the second, the then king of northern Israel. He was the king of the ten northern tribes of Israel. Now, we do notice in verse 1 of chapter 1, Uzziah, the then king of southern Israel. So we have Uzziah the king of southern Israel, which is Judah, and then we see Jeroboam II, 
the king of Israel, the northern tribes, the ten northern tribes of Israel. But even though we see Uzziah and other characters, they are not the main characters. Jeroboam is a main character. Jeroboam the second, he was a not so nice king. He was an evil king. He ruled over northern Israel for 41 years. In Amos 1.1, we notice that Jeroboam II was the son of Joash of Israel. Now, Jeroboam II ruled northern Israel just like the original Jeroboam, Jeroboam I, who became the first king of the ten northern tribes of Israel right after Judah and Israel split, right after they parted ways. Jeroboam I, whom Jeroboam II succeeded, Jeroboam I, was the one who started a golden calf cult in northern Israel. He did that for one main reason, to control the people. He, he, he began that golden calf cult to, to control the people, to maintain political power in northern Israel. The golden calf was commissioned and the golden calf was actually placed in the sanctuary of God, in the sanctuary of Yahweh. This is how sinful, that is how sinful the people became. Now, Jeroboam II continued that golden calf cult and also encouraged the people of Israel to worship other gods. It didn't matter, just worship foreign gods to control the people, to control political power. Jeroboam II, ruled northern Israel during the times of Jonah, Hosea, Joel, and Amos. So in their lifetimes, this was the king of northern Israel. Now the third main and most important character is, of course, the Lord. And you'll notice it's all caps, L-O-R-D, that is Yahweh, Yahweh, Lord, God, Amos 1, 2. Now there are other characters, like I said, mentioned. But these are the main characters, Amos, Jeroboam the second, and of course, of most high importance, God himself. Chapters 1 and 2, Hebrew poetry. So we begin to see, when we get to verse 3 in chapter 1, the use of the writing technique called parallelism, the successive verbal constructs corresponding in either grammatical structure, sound, meter, or meaning. Now here's some examples. Look at verse 3 in chapter 1. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. Now, verse 3, there are two repeating phrase successions that cue us that this is parallelism. Now, the first phrase is, this is what the Lord says. For three sins, or even for four. I will not relent. Now, he does insert the different nations, but that is the first phrase that cues us that this is possibly going to be parallelism, succession. First phrase, this is what the Lord says, for three sins, even for four, I will not relent. Chapter 1, verse 3. The second phrase is either, says the Lord, look at verse 5, I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aaron will go into exile. To, to Kerr, says the Lord. That's another key. We see that repeated. Now, it's either going to be that exact, says the Lord, or it's going to be, says the sovereign Lord, or 1-8, declares the Lord. So two phrases cue us to parallelism. This is what the Lord says, for three sins or even for four, I will not relent. We see that repeated. Second phrase is either going to be, says the Lord, says the sovereign Lord, or declares the Lord. We see that at the end of when he talks about one nation, he ends with, says the Lord, declares the Lord, says the sovereign Lord. And he begins with, this is what the Lord says, for three sins, even for four, I will not relent. We see those phrases that cue us to parallelism because this is Hebrew poetry. Now, these examples are parallelism, and they carry throughout chapter 2, verse 6. So we see it beginning in chapter 1, verse 3, and it carries through to chapter 2, verse 6. The only difference is to which nation the Lord is addressing. That's a lot to think about. 
but it's all very important. Very important. Let's continue reading through our text. Now, I want us to back up to chapter 1, verse 3, and I want us to read all of chapter 2. You ready? It's going to be a long read. 1 3, starting 1 3, and we're going to go all the way through chapter 2. I get my pages to flop right here. Okay. This is what the Lord says For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent. Because she threshed Gilead with sledges having iron teeth. I will send fire on the house of Hazael that will consume the fortresses of Benadad. I will break down the gate of Damascus. I will destroy the king who is in the valley of Avon and the one who holds the scepter in Beth Eden. The people of Aram will go into exile to curse as the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent because she took captive whole communities and sold them to Edom. I will send fire on the walls of Gaza that will consume her fortresses. I will destroy the king of Ashdod and the one who holds the scepter in Ashkelon. I will turn my head against Ekron till the last of the Philistines are dead, says the sovereign Lord. That's that cue to parallelism. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Tyre, even for four, I will not relent. That's another cue to parallelism. Because she sold <coughs> excuse me, whole communities of, of captives to Edom disregarding a treaty of brotherhood i will send fire on the walls of tyra that will consume her fortresses this is what the lord says for three sins of edom even for four i will not relent because he pursued his brother with the sword and slaughtered the women of the land because his anger raged continually and his fury flamed unchecked i will send fire on teman that will consume the fortresses of bozar this is what the lord says for three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not relent, because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead. In order to extend his borders, I will set fire to the walls of Reba that will consume her fortresses amid war cries on the day of battle, amid violent winds on a stormy day. Her king will go into exile, he and his officials together. This is what the Lord says. Parallelism, chapter 2, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not relent, because he burned to ashes the bones of Edom's king. I will send fire in on Moab that will consume the fortresses of Kiroth. Moab will go down in great tumult amid war cries and the blast of the trumpet. Verse 3, chapter 2, I will destroy her ruler and kill all her officials with him, says the Lord. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Judah, even for four, I will not relent, because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his decrees, because they have been led astray by false gods, They're the gods their ancestors followed. I will send fire on Judah that will consume the fortresses of Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Israel, parallelism, for three sins of Israel, even for four, I will not relent. They... They sell the innocent for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They trample on the heads of the poor as on the dust of the ground and deny justice to the oppressed. Father and son use the same girl and so profane my holy name. They lie down beside every altar on garments taken in pledge. In the house of their God they drink wine taken as fines. Yet I destroyed the Amorites before them, they that were tall as the cedars and strong as the oaks. I destroyed their fruit above and their roots below. I brought you up out of Egypt, Israel. I brought you up out of Egypt and led you 40 years in the wilderness to give you the land of the Amorites. I also raised up prophets from among your children and Nazarites from among your youths. Is this not true, people of Israel? Declares the Lord. It's a cute parallelism. But you make the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets not to prophesy. Now then, I will crush you as a cart crushes when loaded with grain. 
the swift will not escape, the strong will not muster their strength, and their warrior will not save his life. The archer will not stand his ground, the fleet-footed soldier will not get away, and the horseman will not save his life. Even the bravest warriors will flee naked on that day, declares the Lord. Parallelism. Did you see all of that now that we've talked about it? Poetry. It doesn't necessarily have to rhyme. Rhyme, roses are red, violets are blue. I love you, boo, boo, hoo. It don't have to rhyme like ours does, usually. It, it, there's no rhyme, but there is reason. There is meter. And we see that through the phrases that are used. They're repeated over and over again. We say that in the Psalms as well. Homework questions from last week. We just read through chapters 1 and 2. I know you read the whole thing, and we just read chapters 1 and 2 again, but that's part of our study. That's the way I do things. That's what's going to teach us more and more as we read it again and again and again and again. Very important. Homework questions. Look at, look at some of those. The, the homework question number one. From chapters 1 and 2, what eight nations was God directing his judgment toward? Now, they were pretty easy to find if you read it. One, Damascus, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. The second nation, Gaza, chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. The third nation, Tyre, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. The fourth nation, Edom, 1, 11 and 12. The fifth nation, Ammon, 1, verses 3 through 15. The sixth nation, Moab, chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. The seventh nation, Judah, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And then the last nation mentioned, Israel, chapter 2, verses 6 through 16. Now you're you're giving me the answers, and everyone answered correctly, but you didn't give me the scripture references. That's important. You may not think it is, but there's a rhyme to my madness. There's a reason for my madness to get you to study and answer the questions completely. Uh, it, there's a reason. It's a study habit. It, it's to get you to study, because one day, if you're not a, a life group leader, if you're not leading a Bible study, if you're not participating in a live Bible study, uh, if you do those things, if you become a leader or if you're studying with a group in, in person, it's good to be able to be quick and know right where that's at. So the verses are important. Don't Please don't just give me the answer. Also give me the references because that's important, especially when we're running cross-references because you have to prove what you believe. And the way you prove what you believe is because you found a, a backing up evidence in other parts of the Bible. So always, always, everyone answered correctly, but not everybody gave me the scripture references. Very important. Question number two. After you list the eight nations, everybody got the nations right. They just didn't provide scripture references. There were sins that were mentioned, particular sins mentioned by God for those eight nations. Now, there's too many to mention, and everyone that turned in their homework did awesome. Some were missed. It doesn't matter. There's a lot of them. So there are too many to mention here. We'll be in an hour of a Bible study. But the points behind that, this kind of question list the sins, even though it was a lot. Th th there, there are two points to why. One, for you to learn to dig, to dig in the Word of God and not just surface study. Get deep in your study. So that's why I ask for scripture reference. That's why I ask for all the sins. Dig it, dig it, dig it. That's the first reason. And the second one is to lead us into application. So there's two points, two reasons why I asked you to list the sins and why that was a tedious thing to do. One, get you used to digging, and two, it's going to help us, lead us to New Testament applications. Now these next two questions, the last two questions, lead us into application. Question number two, list the eight sin, list the sin, list, list the eight nations now, question number three, list the sins that each nation committed. Now, number four helps us, sets us up for application. So, this is where you, right now, you've got to think. Right now, we're together here 
you must put on your thinking cap. You must follow me. If you need, pause the video. What? Go back. Listen to it again. Not, not me, but listen to, listen to the words again. Listen to the teaching again. Thinking cap's on here. Follow me very closely. Question number four from last week. Let me get me some tea. Mm. Do you notice, did you notice anything interesting between the first six nations? And I gave you a clue. I gave you a hint. Think of the first six nations in equal sets of two. Six divided by two is three. So we were to think through question number four in two equal sets of three. Three nations versus three nations, and they were in consecutive order. Remember, think with me, follow along. The first three nations, this is, some, this is interesting between the, the six. The first three nations, Damascus, Gaza, and Tyre were all Gentile nations. They were non-Israelites. They were foreigners. Damascus, Gaza, and Tyre, Gentile nations, not Israel, foreign. The second three nations, Edom, Ammon, and Moab, were all Israelite nations, not foreigners. They were God's chosen people. Let's think about that again. The first three nations, Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Gentile nations, non-Israelites, foreigners. Second three, Edom, Ammon, and Moab, all Israelite nations, God's chosen people. So, we see God's judgment on Gentile nations as well as Israelite nations. At that point in biblical history, at that point in the Old Testament, in Amos chapters 1 and 2, we see God's judgment both on the Gentile nations and his precious chosen nations, Israel. Now, there was a clue that only one person in our study group found that helps us to see this. Now, it was easy to miss, but when you see it, you're going to go, oh. One person found the clue. One person shared with me the clue that relates to the three Gentile nations and the three Israelite nations, God judging, God judging them equally on equal ground. One student picked up on it. The clue was how each nation was addressed. The clue is in the personal pronoun that was used. Look at verse chapter 1, verse 3. Read it. Chapter 1, verse 3. Look at the personal pronoun. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Damascus, even for four, I will not relent because she. One six. This is what the Lord says for three sins of Gaza, even for four, I will not relent because she, personal pronoun she. Now look at one nine. This is what the Lord says for the sins of Tyra, even for four, three for four, I will not relent because she. Again, the personal pronoun she. So the first three nations. Gentile, she, she, she. Now look at the shift. Notice the shift in personal pronoun. One eleven. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Edom, even for four, I will not relent because he.
Look at 113. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not relent because he. Now look at 2.1. This is what the Lord says. For three sins of Moab, even for four, I will not relent because he. Did you see the shift in personal pronouns? With the three Gentile nations, personal pronoun was she. In the three Israelite nations, the personal pronoun shifted to he. So what? Think about that. Think about biblical culture. Think about the culture during biblical time. Even some cultures today in 2022. Historically, during biblical time, males, the male dominated. Males were important. Females were considered unimportant. They were often considered property. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't, don't, don't hear only that. Females were respected. They were respected, but they were lesser than the males. You know that that dominated biblical culture. The three Gentile nations who were referred to as she, they were considered less than Israel. They were considered less than the Israelite nations, which were referred to as he. Something as small as a personal pronoun changes the dynamic of the Word of God. It's true. We read it. I showed it to you. We go, oh, I read it. I didn't see that. One person did. Kudos to you. Exciting. When I saw that, I just about fell out of my chair. I was so excited to see that somebody picked up on that difference, she and he. She, Gentile nations, considered less than the he, Israelite nations. Also, you should have noticed that Edom, Ammon, and Moab were ancestrally related to Israel. Now, the first three nations, Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, had no connection to Israel. But Edom, Ammon, and Moab were ancestrally connected, ancestrally related to Israel. Who was Edom? Esau, the son of Isaac, was Edom, who was Ammon. Ammon was the son of Lot, who was Moab. Moab also was the son of Lot. Israel was Jacob. Do you see that ancestral connection of the last three in that set of six? Three Gentile, three Israelite, re related to Israel. Now, I've got a family tree. And I want to show it to you. It may be hard to see, but you can kind of see it right there. And I'm going to point to just a few things, if I can, backwards. Well, I can't, so I'm going to just hold it back here a little bit. Terah, father of Abraham and Haran. We're going to forget Nahor right now because he's not in this. Terah is the father of Abraham and Haran. Haran is the father of Lot. Lot is the father of Moab and Ammon. Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Isaac and Rebekah, Esau. Esau, tribes of Edom. So they're, these last three, let me find them again. Edom, Ammon, and Moab, all related, bloodline related to Israel. The other three were not. Abraham, Isaac, 
Rebekah, Esau, which is Edom, Terah, Haran, Lot, Moab, Ammon, father of Jacob, all of this, Isaac and Jacob, all of this is interrelated. They're all related. The other three nations were not. They were foreign. Why is that so important? Why am I so excited about that? Why should you care about that much detail? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> it's so important. It's so important because what we have in the book of Amos, chapters 1 and 2, is a foreshadowing. It is an indicator of what is to come in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. That's why that much minute detail of study is important. We have rightly divided the word. Chapters 1 and 2 of Amos foreshadow, direct, indicate what is to come in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. Jesus came, you'll remember this from Sunday's sermon, Jesus came to be the propitiation, the substitute, the atoning substitute sacrifice for all people, all people, for whoever will believe. The New Testament application here is this. God shows no partiality. When it comes to judgment, God shows no favoritism. There is no partiality. Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35. Then Peter replied, I see very clearly that God shows no favoritism. In every nation, he accepts those who fear him and do what is right. See, Amos 1 and 2, the difference in those three Gentile nations, three Israelite nations being judged, God judged them harshly, points forward to Christ's work on the cross as a propitiation substitute for all people, all who believe. Peter recognized that in the house of Cor Corelius. Cornelius, rather. And Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He was a Gentile. But God showed everyone present. We have it in our Bible. He showed everyone. Now I'm crossing over to the Gentile nations. So Peter recognized that. And Peter said, I see very clearly that God is not just sticking with Israel. He is crossing this border. He is, the veil is tearing here. The road is is." Is, is coming together, dividing here. He, there's no more division. There are Gentiles and, Rome and, and, and uh, Israelites. God is now seeing them as one in Jesus Christ. That's so important because without that grafting into Israel, we would not be able to be saved. But we can now because Christ died on the cross. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended to the Father. The Holy Spirit has been given, given as a gift. We now have been grafted into the family of God, Israel being the root, Israel being the stump, Jesus the root, were, were grafted in. Cor, Cor, Cornelius, I keep wanting to call him Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman centurion. He was considered by all the biblical scholars that I have studied to be the first Gentile convert. Amos 1 and 2, three Gentile nations, three Israelite nations, God judging on equal ground, foreshadows this. All that were in Cornelius' house were saved and baptized. God shows no partiality. Romans 2, 9 through 11. Listen to this. There will be trouble and calamity for everyone who keeps on doing what is evil. For the Jew first, we understand, for the Jew first, and also for the Gentile. But there will be glory and honor and peace from God for all who do good. For the Jew first, and also for the Gentile. For God does not show favoritism. Amos 1 and 2 points to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. No favoritism. One under God. This is great application for us. We aren't to look at anyone down our pious noses with harsh judgment. 
regardless of a person's circumstance, regardless of a person's condition, we are to treat them the same. We are not to treat them any differently than we would our closest friend. No favoritism. God loves all people very much. He gave his son for all who believe. God shows no partiality, no favoritism. So why or what gives you, why or what gives me the right to do so? Nothing. Let me leave you with this, and then we'll look at our homework assignment for next week. Mark chapter 12, verse 31. Love your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 7, 12. Do to others whatever you would like them to do to you. This is the essence of all that is taught in the law and the prophets in the Word of God. That's some great application. That's good stuff. I've enjoyed this study. So far, it's really good. Homework questions for next week. <sighs> Excuse me. Reread chapters 3 and 4. Really? Reread chapters 3 and 4. Don't cheat. And here's your first question. Even though God will judge all nations equally, why did he hold Israel to a higher standard? Why did it seem like he was holding Israel to a higher standard? He was, but he's still judging all equally. But he held Israel to a higher standard. Why? After you read your chapters 3 and 4, why? Second question. What was the significance of chapter 3, verse 12? So you're going to have to look at chapter 3, verse 12, and answer what was the significance of 3, verse 12. Hint, God was promising Israel something. Look at that. Question number 3. What was God saying to Israel in chapter 4, verses 14 and 15? What was God saying to Israel in chapter 4, verse 4 through 15? It should be through 15. I'm sorry. I glanced down. What was, the, what was God saying to Israel in chapter 4, verses 4 through 15? And then the last question. What was God saying to Israel in chapter 4, verses 6 through 11? Let me give those again. Reread chapters 3 and 4. Question number one, even though God will judge all nations equally, why did he hold Israel to a higher standard? Question number two, what was the significance of chapter 3, verse 12? Hint, God was promising something. Question number three, what was God saying to Israel in chapter 4, verses 4 through 15? And then the last question. What was God saying to Israel in chapter 4, verses 6 through 11? Again, let me just say, it was a lot today. But that's the beauty of the video. You can pause it, go back, miss what, uh, catch what you missed. I know I talk fast. I have a country accent, and I'm cold, so my mouth's not wanting to work very well. And this tea... You know, sometimes you drink hot tea and it just kind of coats your teeth and coats your mouth. It does that, but it's good tea. It's uh, sweet and spicy. It's good. I like it. It's got a cinnamon flavor to it. Anyway, let's pray together, and I, I, I hope to see you Sunday, if not before, as we continue in our um, sermon series on love big. This Sunday is about love big familial love, which is family love, First John chapter 3. You want to get a leg up on studying that. Stick with me. Stay with me through Amos. Next week, we look at chapters 4 and 5. I'm, I'm sorry, 3 and 4. We may not get through it all, but I'm going to try. Chapters 3 and 4 next week. Let's pray, and we will um, call it an evening. The sun's going down. It's getting a little bit colder out here. My ears are going to fall off. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you that you have set us up nicely for a beautiful day today to be able to study your word together. Lord, I pray that we continue to be serious about our study in your word. Lord, I know 
Not everyone is going to stay with the study. Not everyone is going to stick with the study like this. But, Lord, it's so rich. It's so full. And I thank you for giving me the hunger, me the desire to study. Thank you for using me to teach it, Lord. May we hear what we need to hear. May we, may we possibly lay aside that we don't need to, things we don't need to learn. Lord, we all learn differently. Just continue to speak in and through your word, and we know that you're speaking to our hearts. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that helps us learn, helps us understand. We pray and we call on that, on that power within us, Father. We thank you for that gift. Lord, I just pray that you continue to use us as your hands and feet. Lord, use us as instruments of encouragement, instruments of peace, not disunity. Lord, I pray you continue to use our church and our community, continue to lead and guide us. May we be clear on where you want us to go, what you want us to do. When we go to the left, when you've said go right, when we go right, you say go left. If we go contrary to your word, I pray, Lord, that you gently bring us back in line, Lord. We look forward to our future together with you. Lord, we want you to come. I want you to come. Come, Lord Jesus. But I know it's in your hands. It's in your time. It's in your providence. Lord, I just pray you give us the courage, the diligence, uh, the wherewithal to keep going, to keep on keeping on. Thank you for loving us so much that you give us the strength, the energy to keep on going. Thank you for meeting us again. Thank you for teaching us. We love you. We honor you. We praise you. We exalt you. We love you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Well, I love y'all. Isn't that, isn't that a pretty bush behind me? It, it looks like it's coming out of my head. I think it's a chamele, camellia, chameleon bush. I've got like three of them. They smell so good and they're so pretty. That's just part of, part of God's wonderful creation. I hope you've enjoyed that as my backdrop. Not me, but the plant. I love you. Have a good evening.